Okay, it's 945, our time here in Arizona. And um, we're gonna get started. And uh, my name is Susan Charnello. I am the membership director for the International Dark Sky Association. And I'm happy to be here uh, for this webinar, Come to the Dark Side with Globe at Night. And I just have a few things to announce before we get started. Um, I did post in the chat the, um, the uh, what's it called? The um, schedule for all of the meeting in case anyone doesn't have it or they need to refer to it. Um, uh, I also wanted to uh, remind people to put, if you have questions throughout the presentation, please put them in the chat because there will be a Q&A at the end. Uh, and um, so again, please put your questions in the chat. And getting to the program, um, this is Come to the Dark Side with Globe at Night, and we have three presenters. Uh, the first one is Connie Walker, and Connie has been a scientist at NSF's Noir Lab for almost 20 years, creating programs on dark skies education and sharing them via workshops, talks, and events all over the world. She has leadership roles in International Astronomical Union in terms of dark sky protection. In 2020 and 2021, she was co-chair of four multi-day workshops having to do with the artificial light at night and satellite constellation interference on astronomy and society. She is also a member of the board of directors at IDA. Our second presenter is Juan Seguel, and he is a science education and engagement specialist at NSF's Noir Lab. Juan is a civil mechanical engineer from the University of Concepcion with 18 years of experience in the area of engineering applied to the field of astronomy in the optical range and the development and implementation of educational tools in the area of teaching of science and technology for teachers and students. He is currently a science education specialist at the NSF's National Optical Infrared Astronomy Research Laboratory in La Serena, Chile. And our uh, third presenter, is Jamika Marshall. She is an outreach assistant at the International Gemini Observatory, a program of NSF's Noir Lab. She earned her BA in Spanish and MAT from the University of Memphis. She taught high school Spanish in Tennessee for more than 10 years before moving to Hawaii. She currently serves as Communications Education and Engagement Assistant at the International Gemini Observatory in Hawaii and is pursuing her degree in astronomy. And they, ha they have all been supported by uh, Noir Lab's intern, Amber Perlow. And if Connie, you're free to go. Well, uh, greetings to everyone, and we're very, very glad you could be here. Um, if, if you don't mind, everybody, for now, just for now, could you please mute yourselves? Thank you so much. <laughs> so uh, welcome to the workshop on Globe at Night, and my name, as she is, uh, Susan said, is Connie Walker from NSF Noir Lab, and that is your National Observatory in the United States. And I'm here with two colleagues, as she said, Jamika Marshall from Hawaii and, and Juan Seguel from uh, the region of Coquimbo in Chile. 
And I wanted to just give you a peek at uh, just a glimpse of these observatories and what they look like. Uh, they're pretty huge and they have very large, as, as large as four meter telescope. So that's the uh, mirror that's in the telescopes, four meters big. Uh, and so Cerro Tololo Amer Inter-American Observatory is on the mountain called Cerro Tololo, a good name for it then, in Chile and Juan's from there. And the Gemini Observatory, as the name implies, is actually two telescopes, uh, one in, on Mauna Kea in Hawaii in the US and the other in Serapachon on that mountain in Chile. And, and Jamaica works for the one in Hawaii. And, uh, and then there's the Kid Peak National Observatory and I work in the headquarters in Tucson uh, for uh, that entity. Okay, so I just wanted to start uh, on behalf of my colleagues and myself of a tiny overview, uh, just to know what's ahead in this, this workshop. And um, we like to get to know our audience first, and that'll be the next slide in just a minute. And uh, we'll start with a brief poll, just to get an idea of what you guys do, sort of where you come from with your interest in preservation of the night sky. Um, and after a brief overview of what Globe at Night is, a very brief overview. <laughs> uh, we will share a few examples of our past and current projects that have to do with Globe at Night, and they've been vast. And they pretty much fall into about three different categories. And one is a category with teachers and students in different grades. And another is on collaborations with cities and states and regions and countries. And then the third is in partnerships that we've had with various really incredible organizations uh, around the world as well. And as you are listening to this presentation, I want to bring your attention to uh, the bottom part of this, this slide here where it, it asks you uh, if you would like to um, add your thoughts, either questions or answers to the, uh, the issue of having challenges or barriers. And there are, there's a tool there that you, that you can see either by using a QR code or the uh, URL, you can uh, <clears throat> answer by uh, filling out a sticky that you can uh, call up and uh, write on. And uh, so we invite people to do that throughout the discussion here and the discussion we will have personally with you after our little um, presentation. So uh, next slide, we have the uh, poll. So if you would be so kind, uh, Susan, has to initiate the poll. And you'll have to scroll down everybody because there's about um, 10 different categories. So please feel free to fill that out. And hopefully I've been able to, um, we only had 10 choices we could make. So hopefully we fulfilled those uh, different kinds of jobs you might have. Okay. So I think that's about right, uh, Susan, because there's uh, about five of us or so. And so um, let's see what we have for results. We have mostly, well, it's a smattering of all different kinds. We have a, an educator. And we have a few people that are amateur astronomers or astrophotographers. That is pretty darn cool. We have a half a dozen people that are a science communicator or some sort of education and public outreach staff, as well as uh, one member of the IDA chapter at least, and one urban designer, that's exciting, or, or a lighting engineer, one or the other, and uh, three environmentalists, national park rangers, and uh, then there aren't any Girl Scout leaders this time, or Boy Scout leaders, so uh, perhaps there are, but uh, we only asked you to choose an answer. And then, sorry for the half a dozen others, I'll have to ask you at the end what, what professions you're in. Uh, so stay tuned for that, and uh, thank you so much. So uh, let's stop sharing here, and, uh, and I'll, let's go on with the next slide here. All right, now I am probably, as they say in English, preaching to the choir, but I just wanna make sure we're all on the same, uh, sort of have the same foundation here with how light pollution does affect us in, in various ways. So it's not just astronomers 
having the, a, a nice pristine duck, duck sky to do their research, but it's also the billions of dollars that are wasted each year in energy consumption through unshielded lights that are shining upwards. And it's the effects that we have uh, um, that are, are um, done to, to our health actually in, in, in terms of disruption of our day night cycle, which uh, leads to increased risks for things like even obesity or depression or sleep disorders or even, even diabetes. And there's uh, other things as well. But there's the uh, habits and habitats of animals that are negatively affected. And some of them are pushed to even the brink of, of survival. So uh, birds that migrate and uh, are confused by city lights. And then of course the, the washed out sky impedes us from enjoying our own view of the night sky and the starry night sky. And, uh, and last but not least, I think in terms, well, for me at least, this is almost the most important it's the, the relation to our cultural heritage, our right to have a starry night sky that's inspired so many people in all the centuries. People like Van Gogh and the starry night painting and people like Holst and his musical composition, The Planets, and people like William Shakespeare, who um, in his sonnets about the moon and his various um, uh, compositions. So we're losing that source of inspiration by an increased uh, light, uh, light polluted sky. So we, we all have to be good stewards and because when we lose a starry night sky, we lose it a lot. And that's my, my podium for that tonight. <laughs> and, but just very briefly, we all know, I think here, hopefully what we can do ourselves at home and you can basically use the IDA postcard that uh, is, is available to everybody, especially downloadable online. It's wonderful because it kind of reminds us, you know, to ask yourself, uh, does the outdoor light serve a clear and necessary purpose? Is the amount of light appropriate for the intended task? Are the bulbs energy efficient? Uh, does the light fall where it's needed and it's shielded and facing downwards? Is the light connected to active controls like timers and motion sensors? And does the light serve, uh, so source have a warm color so that it only emits, um, uh, you know, the, the amber color light maybe and, le and less harmful blue light is what you what you want. So just, just a brief overview in, of uh, what you can do at home, but also to segue into Globe at Night, if you also want to take an active part in a different way of protecting the night sky, you can also you know, participate in Globe at Night. So Globe at Night is a very successful international citizen science campaign to raise public awareness of the impact of light pollution. And it's been running for 16 years in about 180 different countries worldwide. And two thirds of a million people have participated at least. And a quarter of a million observations have been uh, logged so far. And just in 2020, we're very lucky, even during the pandemic, to get 30,000 um, Globe at Night measurements from almost 100 countries. And this year, we're going to surpass 25,000. The worldwide campaign involves the public in recording the night sky brightness by matching their view of a constellation, like a familiar constellation, like Orion, which is prevalent at the beginning of the year. And, uh, and uh, it has these maps of progressively fainter stars. So the first uh, map would be, number one would be like you'd see in New York City with only a couple of stars. And the seventh map would be like you would see in the national parks with so many stars, you can't tell one constellation from another. And this campaign is done 10 days each month when the moon is not out in the first half of the night to avoid you know, it being like a natural light bulb in the night sky basically. So if you're looking at these maps on the right hand side, you'll see one of the United States and one of Europe, you'll see a bunch of colored dots on there. And uh, you'll see some other maps and those colored dots will re it represent uh, either a brighter uh, sky or a darker sky, depending on uh, if they're very bright in color or very dark in color. It's not, it kind of goes hand in hand, uh, common sense. So, so um, and I just want to make sure that people know how easy it is to take Globe at Night measurements. The, the <laughs> you spend more time getting your eyes dark adapted than you do taking the measurement. It's really it's really um, bizarre in that fashion, but you have to get dark adapted. That's true. So we usually tell people uh, that are on the older side, like maybe 15 minutes or longer if you can to get your eyes adjusted. And then the young people, ugh, 
10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes. Um, but you wanna actually turn off, if you're doing it at home in particular, you have control of the lighting situation outside. So we ask that you turn off your outside lights. You even turn off lights that might be shining outside from your in, inside of your house. So it's as dark as you can uh, make it. Um, and then you uh, try to find the constellation of the month and every month almost, not, not all the time, but there's a different constellation like the um, different ice cream of the month <laughs> is a different constellation of the month. And, um, and this, uh, so this one we have here in, in this, in this um, slide shows you Leo a lion, uh, which was a few months ago. So you find your constellation and you can do that by visiting the pages of Purple Orbit Night and it gives you some suggestions, but you can also uh, use a, uh, an app on your phone or uh, on your computer to find where they are in the night sky. Um, and then you would go to the Purple Orbit Night webpage, which is very easy to do because it's just purpleorbitnight.org slash web app, W-E-B-A-P-P slash. And that is your our report page. And this was actually created like in 2012 or, or even before that point when web app, apps weren't really on the phone just yet. And we knew that uh, something had to be out there where people get could easily uh, on any platform, any phone, get a hold of this web app and be able to take measurements with their phone. So it was created back then, believe it or not. And um, it works like a charm. So the first thing you would do is you'd enter uh, your date and your time. And believe it or not, when you're doing this, you can actually set it to be a pink, pinkish screen and not a blaring white screen. So you, you see, and if you have a smartphone, your date, your time and your location will be automatically logged. So that's perfectly, it just goes beautifully. So the only thing you need to enter are two things. The first one is you choose which chart best resembles the night sky that you see, and you're not counting stars, you'll have like seven choices, and you just, you look for the faintest stars that you can see, and you match them with your map. And that will be your indication of how bright or how dark your night sky is. So you're basically rating your night sky in terms of light pollution. And then the only, the second thing you have to do input, if you have a smartphone, you, you only have to do two things, first the map, and then secondly, the choice of one of four images on how much cloud cover that you have. And one, the first one will be a clear sky and the fourth picture will be a very cloudy sky. And I hope you're not taking data when you have a cloudy sky because that data you know, doesn't really, you won't be able to see anything. So, um, <laughs> and then after you've uh, chosen that, if you have a sky quality meter, which um, I am gonna kick myself because I was supposed to bring that to my table here. Um, but it is a, about the size of a deck of cards. You can get it from a company called Unihedron at unihedron.com. They're um, about 85 bucks. I think they might have recently gone up in price a little bit. Um, 85 bucks if you tell them you're from using it for Globe at night. It's a little discount. And, um, and if you don't have it, don't worry. The number, when you press the button that says start and you hold it above your head without anything in the way, uh, that number, the, the higher it is, like the higher the chart is, the darker your sky is going to be. And, um, and then you just enter it in that line for, for uh, the SQM, the sky quality meter data, and you just hit submit here, I think it says, right? Uh, submit data, excuse me, and you are done. And that it takes literally less than a minute. And your observation, if you wanna take more, you're more than welcome. Uh, but of course, uh, one is, is very appreciated. And, uh, and, um, and if you want to see what the um, actual screens look like at each of these steps, there you have it. And this is our web app on the online. So just to wrap up this portion of our presentation about uh, this very, very quick tutorial on how to use Globe at Night, uh, we have the dates here, uh, starting with this next one and going through 2022. All these dates are now online, as well as the postcards that you see for 2022 in Spanish and in English, and soon we'll have them in other languages too. We usually have them in about 20 plus different languages for all over the world. And our activity guides, if you don't have uh, the ability to do it by uh, an app or the web app online, we also have activity guides you can download in even more languages, about 28 different languages typically, and those will be uh, online next month. 
All right. So let's let's give you some examples. Um, there are some, this is, people always ask this, I'm not going to go into it too much, but they ask for how the data is used. It's used in a variety of ways, and, and some of it is listed here. Primarily, the data is used to monitor over time the changes in light pollution levels, and it's, it's a very good indication of that. Um, but, uh, but what we're going to show you in the next uh, few slides are uh, three different sets of activities, as I mentioned before. And the first one, and then, you know, after that, we're going to be very happy to answer your questions uh, that you're going to have, if you, that hopefully you have on the various activities. Some of them may, you know, strike your fancy and you'll say, hey, I really want to learn more about that particular type of activity. So the first of the three sets of activities we're going to talk about are the ones done with teachers and students uh, from elementary through college. So we have about four slides on that. And I'll go to that. Uh, Jamika, you have that first slide. Excellent. OK, thank you so much. I'm very happy to be here with everyone this evening. So here in Hawaii, um, I am very excited to be um, part of the support promoting the Globe at Night and awareness of light pollution. And of course, here, um, most people are very aware of our night skies because we have observatories, of course, on Mauna Kea. <laughs> And so because of that, our students are already doing some astronomy activities, and I was really happy to see that I was able to uh, fold in uh, connecting participation with the globe at night already into the activities that we've been promoting. So I'm in my initial stages of setting up uh, and confirming collaborations with uh, our current uh, local school teachers that we have relationships with, uh, and I'm focusing on high school students. And here I'm finding that I really need to make sure I know what resources that they need in order to participate and that I can provide the support that's necessary. So I'm very excited about that. Okay, thank you very, very much. And uh, remember everybody, uh, please, uh, Feel free to put your questions in the chat when you have them and we'll go through them at the end here. Um, all right, so, so one of the coolest things I ever saw was with a group of elementary school uh, kids in a school district and the entire district took, place, took part in the Globe at Night campaign one year. Uh, 3,700 students, uh, I think did about 3,400 measurements from a dozen schools and, and a couple of middle schools, a uh, dozen elementary schools and a couple of middle schools in that district. And the students were at, um, visualizing their data by building a 35,000 piece Lego map. Have you ever heard of such a thing? That's, that's it there in the lower left-hand corner and the lower right-hand corner. And they also visualized it with a computer program as well. These kids are really dynamic. And they were asking themselves how much of the night sky that they had lost. And out of those 35,000 Legos, they actually took away 12,000 pieces to represent the actual data that they had obtained. And that's what you see resulting uh, in those lower, lower half of the uh, slide there. So that was pretty darn cool. So that's one incredible project you might want to ask us more about. Um, and then uh, in, for high schoolers, we picked out a project where, uh, uh, again, you know, I just want to remind you that the, in this map, the, the brighter dots are the brighter uh, locations with the brighter skies. So this survey was uh, of global night measurements was done with both uh, um, you know, unaided eye measurements and also with the SQM, the sky quality meter, and uh, students from two high schools uh, in Northern Oklahoma and a bunch of uh, amateur astronomers actually uh, did a grid map of their whole city and found out where the bright areas are at their university and the downtown business areas uh, and took it to their city council, this map. Uh, there, there's an environmental advisory board actually and the mayor and got within two years, though it took two years, got their lighting ordinances uh, made stricter. So this is the dy dynamic uh, things that can happen even with students. Um, okay, so we have Jamika again, please. Yes, thank you, Connie. I'm really excited to um, establish a collaboration with our undergrad students. I was, I sit on the um, 
Mauna Kea Astronomy Outreach Committee, which is a board uh, where the outreach uh, staff at the observatories on Mauna Kea get together every month to plan activities and support uh, community outreach. I was uh, contacted after one of those meetings by uh, one of uh, our astronomers at uh, 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 University of Kauai Institute for Astronomy, and he connected me with um, as new teachers, professors who are teaching Astronomy 101 classes at UH Manoa, who uh, said they were interested in uh, using the Globe at Night as a tool to uh, not only educate their students about uh, light pollution and raise their awareness of it, but to also help them learn uh, about the constellations of the night sky. And uh, here is a picture of the uh, uh, University of Hawaii at Hilo, um, University uh, Astrophysics Club uh, on Mauna Kea doing an activity, and I am hoping to establish a relationship with them. Uh, while I was at UH Hilo a few years ago, I did serve as the president of the UH Astrophysics Club, and so I have a little bit of hopefully influence to uh, get them on board, but I have already gotten interest from them, so I'm looking forward to providing the resources they need to participate. And one of the ways uh, you might might consider doing this, we actually did a research project with a couple of undergraduates and uh, they um, did a study on the impact of city lights on the lesser long-nosed bat, believe it or not, which uh, migrates at certain times of year from the Tucson area down to Mexico and back. Uh, but uh, when, they're in Mex when they're in Tucson, uh, they took uh, 35,000, I wish 35,000, 3,500 sky quality uh, meter measurements. And uh, they did it very uniformly all around Tucson so we could make this contour map that you see here that looks like a topological map. Um, so the peak would be the center of town where it, the light's brightest. And that's the white area there. And they took these, uh, and they also over, they worked with the Arizona Game and Fish Department and they uh, took data from there that had 13, um, uh, the, the routes, 13 bats going from where they sleep to where they eat uh, every night. And, uh, and you can see how the path uh, on purpose avoids the city center actually. Uh, and the question was, what should we do? Uh, is it significant enough to, that we have to go and make stricter laws to protect that corridor that they travel every single night? And, uh, and you'll have to ask me in the question and the answers for more answers. <laughs> so I'm gonna leave it right there. Okay, so uh, that in the next uh, few slides, we're going to mention projects that were undertaken in and around cities, uh, states, regions, and in other countries. And so to start off, uh, I'd like to show you this map here. You can barely see the little dots. The dots in the center are very bright because that is the city of Tucson. The dots at the side, on either side, uh, what I would say east and west of Tucson, this is Tucson, Arizona, are actually the national parks uh, that are on either side of Tucson. And you can see how dark they are, the dark dots. But every uh, few years, it used to be that the National Geographic would sponsor something they called a bio blitz or a species inventory that involved kids of all ages uh, in national parks taking data. And so we thought for the first time in 2011, when they chose uh, our parks on either side of Tucson, that we would do a night sky inventory and compare their data to our data. Uh, and the parks took the measurements uh, that were in the harder to get back country in the Eastern park. And the Boy Scouts took most of the measurements in the Western park. And then we had amateur astronomers with some help from the public who got measurements across four major East West streets uh, across Tucson. And you could see it makes a nice um, bunch of data going from one end, from one park all the way through the city to the other. And they found that um, there is a, a difference of a hundred times brightness from the very center of Tucson to the very Eastern edge of the Rincon Mountains. Uh, so the, from very dark area in the Rincon Mountains to the very bright area, the very center of the city, five magnitudes, which is a hundred times bright. Right, uh, difference in brightness. So it was a very interesting, it got a lot of media attention. So if you're thinking of ever doing something like that and you want the media attention, this is a really good way of doing it. So, um, Jamika? Yes, so thank you, Connie. 
Um, again, as I said earlier, I'm on uh, this board with other outreach staff at the observatories on Mauna Kea. And as such, they most of them had heard of the Globe at Night, uh, which speaks well to the success of this campaign. And so they were really excited, of course, to, to come on board and to help promote it. But of course, we're all very busy. And so I, um, I did uh, provide uh, social media resources, graphics, and all of that so that they could share it on their uh, social media platforms. And um, I also, I've made a video uh, for our virtual program, a virtual series, uh, Mauna Kea at Home, that all of the observatories contribute to on Globe at Night. And I'm looking forward to continuing in that series so that we have a playlist of those uh, so that we can spread the word about the Globe at Night throughout all of the observatories and to reach the communities and, and families that those outreach staff um, serve. Okay, also, you might want to say next slide. <laughs> um, uh, this, this one is for Juan, and Juan, uh, would you like to join us? Yes, uh, thank you, Connie. Um, hello to everyone. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about, about what we have been doing here in Chile in collaboration with other institutions. So let's start with Astronomy Day. Astronomy Day is um, in Chile is celebrated every year around the 20 or 21 of March. And this is uh, a special day that was uh, instituted by the government in 2014. So every year, Noir Lab Chile carry out public activities to celebrate Astronomy Day. And this year in particular, um, uh, the minister the minister, the minister of Science was interested in the promotion of the realization of a citizen side exercise to measure to measure light pollution global yeah. night yeah, no. in all Chile. So uh, the the minister of Science is, is a very new minister here in Chile, just two or three years. So they created a communication campaign. Uh, actually, the, there's a video I, of one minute and a half in, in, the, in the presentation. That is in Spanish, of course. Um, they um, created this special video, another one about uh, this is about Global Night. Um, and this campaign was shown in the national TVs. They post in official government social media channels. So. And, and 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 was um, they were very active uh, in this uh, communication campaign. Also, this campaign received the collaboration of other institutions like SOCHIAS, the Chilean Society of Chilean Astronomers, mm. and the Planetarium of Santiago, and plus Explora. Explora is the pro is a program in Chile that is a focus in uh, K twelve students to work with them and motivate to in science. So Did next want... slide, please. Oh, okay. Thank you. I'm sorry. sorry. Construyamos juntos oh, el mapa de contaminación. Sorry. Did you want me to show this? The... I think it's yeah, but it's too long. I mean, I think we is is going to be too long for the for our presentation. But don't worry. <laughs> sorry. Don't worry. It's it's fine, Connie. So um, so the, the campaign itself was done between the 10 to the 14 of March. Uh, usually our campaign, uh, the Global Night campaign is a little longer, but the, the Minister of Science want to focus in that day. So only five days of the 10 days that we usually have for the Global Night. So this day, they, they, they did this, the, the, the social media campaign and the and, and you see in the, the, the TV spots on the national TV. Um, and we collect nearly 500 data points. That's a lot for Chile. Last year, we collect less than 100 in just one year. And in years before, in the best year, we collect something like 900 in a complete year. So we have 500 in five days. So it was mm -hmm. amazing. After the campaign ended, I, I personally processed the, and filtered the, 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 the data 
and uh, finally convert the measurements to the format that the Minister of Science wanted. <laughs> they wanted in a specific way. Um, so the Minister of Science made some infographics um, um, about uh, each, re each region of our, um, our country with the level of light pollution. You can click on the image and you can see, um, yes, it's in Spanish, so <laughs> sorry. Uh, so there is the number of measurements, the level of, of, of light pollution. So we agreed to create a, a, a scale one to four uh, with high light, high light pollution, medium high pollution, low light pollution, and non light pollution. They wanted it that way in order to you know, share this results. Actually, they make a special event, the day of the Astronomy Day, the 20, where the Minister of Science present the result to the press and, and the community. So it was very, very nice. <laughs> um, you can see also the in the in the in the right uh, image, you can see our country, Chile, a very narrow. <laughs> And you see all the data points com uh, compared with the um, the or the all other countries that surround us: uh, Brazil, Argentina, in the in the in in the same um, dates. And you see a lot of points coming from these uh, measurements. So, um, uh, next slide, please. And well, this this just this show only. Um, we we collect this um the minister of science make this uh the result for every region i just show is just uh 10 regions here we have 15 region in chile a region here in chile is like a, a state in the united states so um um next slide please <laughs> um and and this uh, and this slide, I'm going to talk about a, a recent event was actually uh, this week, at the beginning of this week, and this was a result of our successful collaboration with the Minister of Science, and we were contacted by the members of the Minister of Foreign Affairs, especially from the Chilean Embassy in Singapore, uh, in order to be able to replicate something similar that we did in March. But in this case, the Global Night Campaign in Singapore. This was um, uh, this because this uh, and they want something like this, this this kind of activity because the Science Center of Singapore um, wanted an activity that the with high educational um, pedagogical value to carry out with it, their public, the students, parents, and general public. And this event was done during the Chilean Astronomy Week that was this week, actually, from the 9th to the 11th. Um, and this activity is carried annually by the, um, by the uh, Chilean Embassy of Singapore. Um, we agreed to give a talk with, with them in this, in this event and also present the results of the Global Night in Singapore campaign with the data of from 25 October 25 to November 5. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, on November 9, very early here in the morning, because we have 11 hours of difference, I gave the talk uh, about light pollution, but unfortunately, I was not possible to present the result of Global Night campaign mm -hmm. due, due to very bad weather condition and the measurement days in Singapore. As uh, you see here, the, this was the weather condition in the days of uh, where the campaign was uh, done. So, well, anyway, I invite the audience to participate in the following campaigns, in addition to the, to showing the good results obtained in Chile in, two time, in, 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 the, in March. Um, and I received a lot of questions from uh, the audience. They, 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 this event was hybrid in, in a planetarium show and in um in yeah, and in youtube so i received some question about uh different uh, about light pollution and also global night thank you very much okay so i just want to um
bring you, your attention to at least one of these projects. There's various partnerships, but one of them is from was a whole country on one night that they the um, Global Day was used uh, as a vessel basically to break the Guinness Book of World Records for the most users to take an online environmental sustainability lesson, they called it, in 24 hours. So on their longest night during the year in Australia, uh, on June 21st, they, they had a competition for people around Australia to, uh, you know, uh, take all the global night measurements, and there were 6,700 measurements taken in one single night. And uh, they, you could see the population is mostly on the eastern coast and some other on the western coast. And you can see the bright dots there. Um, and then you can do things like we had statewide min, uh, star parties. This one was with Minnesota with a museum. We've had with a, a, an affiliate uh, organization called SciStarter, which has 3,000. It's like a portal for 3,000 citizen science programs. We've done various um programs with them, especially with libraries and Citizen Science Month each year. There's so many ways to get involved using Globe at Night in the preservation of dark skies. And, and I just, you know, we have another program too that you may want to ask me about called Adopt a Street. So a variety of things you can do here. And the next slide. Um, uh, we have also a, a mentoring program with Girl Scouts. And the one I really want to bring to bear here is that we uh, mentored two Girl Scouts that were twins and they uh, were going for their silver award. And to do that, they created a Dark Skies um, webpage for kids. And it was the most adorable thing and it was very informative and still up, I think. And they got an award from IDA as a result. So there's so many things you can do guys. And we want uh, you to, to, to know that it's all at your, your fingertips. Uh, we were a resource for you. Uh, and now we're gonna open with, uh, um, I guess, uh, Susan asking us the questions that have been put forth here. Uh, Susan? Uh, so we have a two-part question from Isabel. Uh, the first question is, how did the bio blitz data correlate with light pollution? Now that is a good question, but to be honest with you, uh, other people use the data and I, I did not. I was not part of their projects. So I have no real big answer for you on that. I can tell you what we did uh, in terms of the bats uh, in Tucson and, the, and a couple of students that worked with me on the project. We got into an analysis that um, took a, a math that was called logarithmic, logarithmic regression. I can never say that. And it was something I had never seen before that um, the, the ecologist at the Arizona uh, Game and Fish Department used. And it actually just basically tried to identify preferences and avoidance areas for the bat basically is what it came down to. So the analysis took the global at night data, took the areas of Tucson and tried to see with it, about uh, 11 different parameters, which areas were, were um, uh, areas of avoidance for the bats and the preferences. And it, and it, and it whittled it down to three, uh, three areas. One was light pollution, another was what they called echo region, and another was vegetation. And because it was basically evenly uh, divided between the three different areas among the 11 or 12 that were there to begin with, they decided that it wasn't enough um, evidence to go forth and make the laws even stricter in Tucson. They're already strict as they are in terms of lighting ordinances. So that's uh, that was the conclusion there, uh, I can tell you. The second part is how do you separate the direct impacts of artificial light on wildlife from the fact that the most artificial light will tend to be in more developed areas with less habitat and lower species diversity and density. Well, you know, you still have a lot of wildlife living uh, near cities and uh, just case in point, when, when uh, birds are on their migratory patterns and they're going through cities and it's near sunset, for instance, 
They see the reflection of the sun set in buildings with lots of glass, for instance. And they, they sometimes there are stories of them, you know, um, circling buildings and, and dying of exhaustion or some even uh, uh, fly into the buildings. And there's like a, uh, I heard, I thought I heard Ruskin, uh, the, the CEO, I mean, the uh, executive director of IDA say today, there were 6 million birds in the United States. But I thought, I know there's more than a million uh, each year that, that uh, have these, these sort of things happen on their, as they're migrating uh, from either north, south or, or, or south to north and um, through cities. So, uh, and that's just one case of one species and others are like um, sea turtles. Uh, and, and there's more people here probably in the audience that are better uh, acquainted with that than I, but uh, such as Diana Umpir, who's here. Hi, hi Diana. Um, and uh, uh, who may be a little less more, but um, they, if, if, you know, they have, say on the coast of Florida, they do have uh, curfews. So at eight o'clock when there's, uh, when, the, when they know, like in starting in May, I think it is, when, when the mother turtles come on shore to lay their eggs, they, the people are, are, are demanded, they, they actually uh, put um, shades up, no light escapes from the condos that are on the, you know, facing the ocean. So those, those mama turtles can actually lay their eggs and, and, uh, and they could hatch, you know, um, after the gestation period, I guess, and, uh, um, and safely make it back into the ocean without being having you know diverted their uh, attention to the the, the uh, street lights or, or big, big business lights actually and the lights of the hotel. So um, so I mean those are the kind of things we still have to be very very attuned to and uh, very much good stewards of. Uh, if that makes any sense to your question, Isabel. Okay, another question from Diana. What recommendations? do you have to do globe at night in South Florida where we have so many cloudy days? <laughs> um, you, you can't really uh, deal with mother nature. So, <laughs> so you, you really do have to be patient. Um, can I also ask if Jamika or Juan have any words of wisdom on that? I'll say uh, that here in Hilo, we have a lot of cloudy evenings and it's really frustrating. Um, it, yeah, it's just really frustrating. And so, yes, you have to have some determination to actually go out and maybe find some spots that even when it's cloudy, you can still see a good amount of the sky, even if it's just, a, you know, a quarter of the sky. So, you know, people here will just go partial, partially up the mountain to get out of the clouds and just hang out right there around, you know, 8,000 feet just to, to get a clearer view. Um, so yeah, having that determination, go out there and have some some fallback spots just in case when it's clouded that you can maybe get a few a few good glimpses of something. And I, okay. it looks like we have one more question mm -hmm. um, from Kirill in Russia. Um, and it says, I track the change in the area of the light halo over the cities. And I use the map that Juan showed. And I have a question, what was this map based on? And is there any access to its database? Hello, you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yes, uh, actually, is the the all the information is in the Global Night uh, web page. I can point you where it is now. I'm copying the the in the chat the the link um, already in the chat. The Global yeah, the link. It's and there is um, all the maps of well general maps, but also is a database in different formats. And from every year, uh, it's like in um, in TXT, uh, Excel, Google Maps, and so you can. Ah, oh, Connie is showing now. So you have every year. You have by year, so you need to put everything together. Um, and in order to work with them, you um you're going to see different uh, columns with, and you're going to see the column of the, of the country so you can separate it very easily 
if you are familiar with Python, for example, it's, it's just a few uh, code sentence and in Python to, to separate everything in the database uh, and just be focused in what you want. But it's, it's very easy, even in Excel, you can, you can do it. And um, I would like to add to that if that's okay, Juan. Yes, sure. Um, you can go into the interactive map and you can zoom around anywhere in the world and, and, and zoom into whatever location you wanna see uh, the data. And, uh, and, um, and also, um, this, unfortunately, Google changed its rules one or two years ago where it used to show all our data points. So if we had 20,000 data points, it would show all of them. Right now, it's only showing like the latest 2,000, which is really aggravating. So we're, next this coming year, we'll be trying to figure out a way to get around that and have all of the data shown. Uh, so you have to really zoom in to see your area. And one really excellent way to do that instead of uh, doing this kind of thing uh, is to actually go back to the page with the um, data. You'll see the word regional map. And that one there is, is, in, is very, very useful. So let's say, where, where are you in Russia? Where was that again? The Caucasus Federal University. Oh, well, um, I don't know if it would give me that, but if I knew the city, say it's in St. Petersburg, I don't know if uh, there's a lot of points in St. Petersburg, but we'll look, uh, Russia. And we say map it, it'll go exactly there. And then you say the year you want, say it's this year, and you say the radius, maybe you say 100 or whatever value you wanna put in there. And that is in kilometers. And you say map it, and you will see uh, the map. And well, see, you have to get people there doing globe at night right because no data points there at the moment but that's where you would see different data points oh there's one right here it looks like and that one was taken uh that was um number seven uh, seventy four thousand two hundred thirty one, and uh, they had a very dark measurement uh, the darkest you can get which is limiting magnitude which means the faintest star you can see has a magnitude of seven and the higher the number the darker the sky so there you go and you can get, and then if you want, you can download all your data with, uh, with that CS file that you saw here. That'll download all your data and, and uh, all the magnitudes and locations and, and uh, uh, weather conditions and, uh, and uh, comments too, if you have them. So you'll see all of that in the database. Well, our time is coming to a close. Um, so I just want to thank our um, presenters, Juan and Jamika and Connie, of course, and Amber. And I want to thank all the people that are here and seeing this great presentation. And there's a lot more coming up uh, for the rest of the conference. And so I hope everyone uh, takes advantage of that. And do we, do we have about eight more minutes though, right? Can I just show a, um, a like a one or two minute video? Oh, okay, go ahead. Yeah, so I have 838 here, so sorry. Um, okay, this was a video that was done through a program we had created a long time ago called Dark Sky Rangers with, with Portugal and myself and uh, in the United States. And it was just incredible. And, and people got very active in Portugal. And this is from a seven year old boy Okay, who who uh, wrote to his mayor, and uh, and and tried to convince the mayor to change out some lights on his street, and was actually successful, and I and he made a video. Actually, he wrote the, this video and sent it to his mayor. So I'd like to show it to you. It has English subtitles, but it is in Portuguese. So let me just see if I can play this. And I have the sound on. Let me see if it works. Esta é a minha rua. Como podem ver, está muito mal iluminada. Os candeeiros são mesmo péssimos. Iluminam para onde não é preciso, para o céu. Senhor Presidente da Câmara, estou a pedir-lhe, troque esses candeeiros por outros, tapados em cima e dos lados, para iluminar melhor a rua, diminuir a poluição luminosa e ainda poupar dinheiro. Eu sou um da Sky Rangers, porque quando for grande, quero ser poeta. 
E os poetas precisam das estrelas brilhantes e da lua romântica para se inspirarem no seu pensamento profundo. And he was successful. And this is a seven-year-old boy. So if a seven-year-old boy can do this, we can do this, everybody. Okay. That was adorable and a, a great thing to end on. I'm glad you played that, Connie. So thank you again to everyone. And um, we will see you in the next sessions, hopefully. <laughs> Thank Good you, night. Susan. Good okay. night. Bye bye. Bye, everyone. Aloha. Bye bye. Ciao.